Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening from Gox Center for Contemporary Art in Prague and from on board the Gulliver airship. That's the space behind us. Um, it's not a graphics, it's real space that is propped up or that sits on the rooftop of Dox, and it is a space where art meets literature. My name is Michaela Šelpochová. I am the program director of Dox, and I would like to welcome you all, friends of Dox, friends of art and literature, and especially Irish literature, as that, this is the, going to be the subject of today's conversation. Therefore, sitting next to me is Andre Pilny, director of the Center for Irish Studies at Charles University Prague, um, a specialist in Irish literature, a great translator himself, and also a steering force behind this program. So welcome, Andre. Thank you Hello. for being here. Some great Irish writers have sailed on board this airship uh, in the past, such as uh, Anne Enright or John Banville. We paid tribute to um, Seamus Heaney, uh, whose wonderful poem, Lightning's Eight, was um, read at the official inauguration of the Gulliver airship. And significantly, of course, uh, the airship bears the name of one of the great characters in Irish literature, Gulliver, the great traveler, the explorer of faraway lands and distant territories. Here at Docks, we like to explore uh, the links and connections and overlaps between individual artistic genres. And tonight's uh, conversation, this program on air, is the first of a series of conversations exploring the relationship between art and literature. We are going to discuss how literature can be presented or curated in an art space with the curators of Molly, Museum of Literature Ireland, a beautiful new addition to the Irish literary and cultural landscape. So let me welcome our three distinguished guests. Simon O'Connor, the director of Molly. Welcome, Simon. Great to have you. Benedict Schlepper Connolly, a digital curator of Molly. Welcome, Benedict. And Margaret Kelleher, Chair of Anglo-Irish Literature and Drama from University College Dublin. Welcome, Margaret. As you heard, we are streaming from uh, a most appropriately named airship at the docks, which you can regard as our small steampunk gesture in the direction of COVID-19, which has indeed uh, prevented us from uh, hosting the show face to face with a live audience. We are delighted to be showcasing four Irish writers uh, as part of this program, uh, whose work has recently been translated into Czech or is being translated at the moment, or uh, who we would like to see translated uh, very soon. They are Katrina O'Reilly, one of the most exciting poets, not only of her generation, Mike McCormack, a truly original short story writer, uh, and novelist. Uh, we'll be focusing on his celebrated novel, Solar Bones. Sarah Baum, a wonderful young prose writer, uh, both of whose novels have recently appeared in Czech. And finally, Derin Nigrifa, who is known primarily as an Irish and English language poet, but who also published only last year an amazing prose work, A Ghost in the Throat, an account of a young woman being fascinated or haunted by an 18th century poem of love and mourning, which is also a poignant book about motherhood. In this live program, which will take approximately one hour, uh, you will hear snippets from the author's readings. And when we are finished, uh, you can watch the complete readings introduced by their Czech translators, who also read the same extracts in the Czech language on the Docs YouTube channel and from tomorrow also on the website of the Center for Irish Studies, where they will be posted together with a recording of this broadcast. This is also where you'll find a list of recent translations of Irish writing into Czech. Now, before we get started, it is my pleasure to acknowledge the financial support of the Department of Foreign Affairs Ireland, 
uh, and especially its ESP program, uh, without which this event could not take place. Uh, also, the long-term and indeed cherished partnership between our center and the Embassy of Ireland in Prague. And gratitude is also due to Literature Ireland, the national agency for the promotion of contemporary Irish writing and the support of uh, translations of Irish writing globally. And last but not least, of course, to DOCS for hosting us and to the DOCS technicians for keeping the show afloat. I'll now hand over back to Michaela to introduce the first part of the program, a conversation about curating literature in an art space. Thank you. Um, curating literature in an art space. First of all, what do we mean by curating literature? Um, curating used to be a word that we only used in museums, but um, in recent years or even perhaps decades, this word has been sort of plucked out of the museum context and pasted onto everything, starting with uh, fashion and furniture uh, to travel itineraries or restaurant menus. It seems like everything nowadays can be curated. Here in this conversation, we would like to stay within the original context of the word, its original home, the museum context. And um, from the Latin word curare or um, to take care of, we um, originally understood curating as um, a practice that um, where the curators took care of museum collections. Today, curating uh, is, let's say, understood as a more as a independent, uh, critically engaged, um, creative, and sometimes experimental exhibition making practice. Uh, but curating literature has its own specifics um, and it takes some creativity on the part of the curators if they want to aim for something more than just um, first folios and or valuable manuscript neatly locked up in glass display boxes. Um, but curating literature is first and foremost um, a, an, a wonderful opportunity, an opportunity to invite visitors to, to learn and to explore, to, to share their love of reading and stories, and to understand how much we need literature, especially in um, these digital times. The curators um, of Museum of Literature Ireland, of Molly, have some really fresh ideas on how to curate literature. And before I start um, with asking some questions, uh, let us have a look at a short video presentation of Molly Museum of Literature Ireland. Welcome to Molly, a museum of literature for the world's greatest storytellers. A partnership between University College Dublin and the National Library of Ireland, Molly celebrates Ireland's rich literary heritage from past to present. Visit us here in our home in the historic UCD Newman House on Dublin St. Stephen's Green. Discover new and immersive exhibitions, view literary treasures from the National Library of Ireland, enjoy our dedicated spaces for children and families, and be inspired to explore your own creativity. Be sure to go for a wander in these beautiful tranquil gardens while you're here. And don't forget to stop for a coffee and a bite of lunch at the Commons Cafe, or to have a browse in our lovely gift shop before you go. Book your tickets at molly.ie. We opened our doors in 2019, but the heart of this special place has been beating for centuries. Since the 1700s, the lion sitting over our door has been keeping an eye on St. Stephen's Green and all the lovers, lords and rebels who pass through it. He has watched silently as thousands of people have stepped into our home over the decades. They all leave a mark, but some more than others. Here, St. John Henry Newman helped to establish a university that would go on to educate some of our finest writers. Flann O'Brien, Mary Lavin, James Joyce. They joined the countless others who have given us one of the richest literary traditions in the world. Their words are our treasures. Words to soothe us in times of loss and uncertainty. Words to recall the joy of life. Words to give voice to the struggles of a nation. 
Language is a river that flows through Irish history and we really want visitors to Molly to get a sense of that. You'll hear beautiful readings of Irish writing from centuries ago up to the present day in Irish and in English. Here you see a real gem of the collection, W.B. Yeats's poem, Easter 1916. The poem was published privately in 1917 and is a lament for the signatories of the 1916 proclamation executed for their role in the rebellion. It's hard to imagine the history of Ireland without the literature that helped to shape it. And this poem is one of the finest examples. Here we see the messy work of creation as Joyce seemingly filled these notebooks with every pen and crayon he had to hand, writing and rewriting, working to transform an ordinary day in Dublin into the masterpiece of Ulysses. In this case, we see the fruit of that labor, copy number one, printed and given to Joyce in Paris on his 40th birthday, the 2nd of February, 1922. People often ask us why Ulysses deserves the attention it receives. And the simplest explanation we've come up with so far is this. In this book, Joyce shows us that every life, every day, every one of us contains the extraordinary. It's a celebration of our shared experience as human beings and a celebration of life itself. A sense of discovery and play is vital to creativity and vital to our museum. Our current exhibition on the work of Dubliner Chris Houghton will bring some much needed delight to visitors of all ages, but it's also about celebrating something deeper. From Oscar Wilde to contemporaries such as Deirdre Sullivan, PJ Lynch and Sarah Webb, Irish writers have introduced countless young readers to the joy of reading. Inspiring visitors to read more, write more, and create more is why we're here. The story of our home begins in the Georgian era with the building of numbers 85 and 86 St. Stephen's Green in the 1700s. These stunning buildings would become the first home of University College Dublin. Many notable people passed through these halls as lecturers and students, perhaps most famously James Joyce, who set sections of his novel, A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, in these buildings. We love to host weddings, ceremonies, and special events in these wonderful historic rooms. And who doesn't enjoy a good love story? Visit Molly to find yourself surrounded by peace, beauty, and inspiration. And some of that magic that helps us transform ordinary life, word by word, line by line, page by page, into something truly extraordinary. We look forward to welcoming you to our exhibitions, cafe, shop and gardens very soon. You can book your tickets, buy membership, browse our shop and explore our digital and learning programmes all at molly.ie. So we have seen a little bit of Molly um, in a video and we have now a better idea of what the premises of Molly look like. And I would like now to ask um, Simon, um, I guess in the beginning of Molly, there was a, um, there must have been a strong vision and then a great deal of enthusiasm to bring this vision to life. So my question, first question would be, how was the idea to create a new museum of literature born. Um, thanks, Michaela. So that was uh, really the idea for Molly came about um, through a collaboration between University College Dublin, which is the, the largest university here in Ireland, and the National Library of Ireland. So the two organizations came together really to explore combining um, this site, this beautiful, uh, collection of buildings that we're located in, which was the original home of the university, uh, and then the state literary collections, in particular the Joyce collections um, that, the, that the National Library were holding, and to, to really explore turning this site into a publicly accessible um, exhibition space uh, that, that could hold some of those um, state treasures 
uh, on display for, for visitors. Um, the project developed then over a period of nearly a decade and, uh, and reopened in, in 2019. Thank you. I guess you are lucky in Ireland as there seem to be a number of museums, initiatives and foundations that pay tribute to the great Irish writers, unlike the Czech Republic, where we have relatively few. And um, in fact, in Ireland, uh, some of these museums um, opened their doors to the public uh, fairly recently, such as the Seamus Heaney home place in Belahi or um, the Patrick Kavanagh center in, in Eskeen. And these would be the examples of museums that pay tribute to the work of individual writers. Then there are museums that um, offer a perspective, certain perspective um, of Irish literature, such as, for example, the Dublin Writers Museum, which offer a view, offers a view of Irish literature from um, Dublin perspective. So my next question, uh, how would you describe Molly's uh, focus and perspective, Benedict? Yeah, thanks very much, Michaela. Um, I think at Mali, really, we take quite a, we take quite a wide angled view of, of the art form. And it's very much also a, a museum that, though based in Dublin, is, is for, for the island of Ireland uh, and beyond. Um, I think that uh, while we begin uh, in terms of our genesis uh, and in terms of our, our initial focus, um, you know, we have one, these wonderful treasures from, from the state collections, from the National Library of Ireland uh, and other collections. Um, we also really ce celebrate contemporary Irish writing in a big way and, and also uh, collaborations with, with other art forms. So we really see Mali as a kind of space where um, there, there, there's, there is history. I mean, we, we present over 800 years of Irish literature uh, in, in our exhibitions uh, and in our, in our other programming. But, but we also see it as an opportunity to, to engage very heavily with, with contemporary uh, literature and, and literature's association uh, and associations with other art forms as well. And we really see then the, the exhibition space, uh, as in the, build, the, 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 the physical space of the museum also being uh, a kind of a third space, a kind of, a, you know, it's a space to, to come and, 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 uh, and, and explore exhibitions, but it's also a, a space to come and meet a friend. It's a space to come and and read a book, have a cup of coffee, wander in our gardens. Um, it, 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 it goes beyond, it goes beyond the, the, I suppose, the traditional didactic role that a museum might have. Right. We're going to speak more about um, your exhibitions and other programming in a, in a minute. But um, now speaking about contemporary Irish writers, um, it's time for the first snippet of a reading um, by Katrina O'Reilly. What seemed a simple structure is not so now. O oh, house, device to conceal the obscene, end-stopped corridors sprout like horns and shut me in. Walls of hide stifle my cries, loud as pacifies, whose bull-headed baby tore her breast. So, now, Simon, you mentioned that Molly opened in 2000 and 19, um, but we could say that it reopened after the COVID pandemic just uh, last Friday. Is that correct? The premises of um, uh, Molly offer a generous 10,000 square feet of exhibition space. So how is your exhibition space structured in terms of a permanent um, exhibition or permanent display versus temporary exhibitions celebrating contemporary authors? Yes, uh, well, um, as you say, we, we combine uh, contemporary authors as, as well as as well as his, sort of more historical collections. Um, as you as you enter into the museum, you initially get a sense of the history of this building and the site and its home as a, a, its its role as the first home of University College Dublin. Um, as you move through, you're exposed to quite a lot of of of, of diverse uh, experiences of Irish literature from across centuries as well. Um, and we really, I suppose, in putting together the exhibitions, really wanted to give people a very easy way in to explore many different aspects of the art form. Um, and, and, and as such, as such there, there are many kind of different ways, ways into, into ex uh, discovering different, different authors and, and, um, and pieces of work. 
Um, we have a, a, a couple of temporary exhibition spaces where at the moment we have uh, a, a lovely exhibition about uh, the picture book uh, author uh, Chris Houghton, as well as a, another space where we have a digital exhibition about uh, the writer Nola Ofuelon and her book, Are You Somebody? Um, moving through the collections, we have, uh, we have different focuses on different, different, I suppose, thematic or, or different uh, trends in, in Irish literature, including uh, an exhibition uh, called State and, and, the, and uh, State and the Irish Writing, um, which is about the development of the state uh, in parallel with, with, with literature, as well as focuses on, on different uh, genres, such as, as uh, young adult writing. Um, and 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 we'll be and we'll be kind of focusing on different genres as we as we develop, and we also obviously have uh, wonderful wonderful collections in the building as well. And as you move to our top floor, you would dis uh, you would uh, discover copy number one of Ulysses, which was uh, James Joyce's very first copy of, of the book, as well as his his notebooks and there are other treasures in there. I mean, I could go on for 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 another while speaking about those. So really, as you move through the exhibitions, uh, you're given a sense of of the contemporary, but also the historical. Um, and, and I suppose something that underlines uh, uh, many of many parts of our exhibition is that there's a lot of there's a lot of audio, a lot of a lot of video, and we really wanted to uh, I suppose move away from giving people a lot of, a lot to read uh, as they as they travel through the exhibitions and make it as easy as possible to access access the art form, access what we have in store for for visitors here. Which brings me to my next question. Um, we mentioning an exhibition about literature or a literary work um, as a format is not exactly an easy easy task. So um, you have you have um, um, touched upon that. What what would you see as the biggest challenge, and how do you approach the format of a of an exhibition about literature if you want to avoid um, you know the long texts and you want to make it as accessible to your audience? as possible? Um, that's, a, that's a great question, uh, Michaela. It's a question that we ask ourselves all the time in here. Um, uh, in a way, you know, we're dealing with, we're dealing with an art form that, uh, that people can purchase in a shop and that they ordinarily experience at home themselves in private. Um, so I think as a literature museum, we're not really in the business of presenting the art form to the visitor in the way maybe say a, a portrait gallery might be. Um, I think what our challenge is to, is to just encourage an interest in the art form, to recontextualize it um, for visitors and then to create new routes in, as Benedict mentioned there, new routes into the art form um, and for all visitors as well. So, and I think actually a key part of that is, um, is as you had kind of hinted at earlier on, it's not the glass case exhibition of materiality or, um, or precious folios entirely, although some of that is, is, is really useful as well. Um, it's also exploring completely new ways of talking about this art form um, to people and talking about aspects of it uh, as well um, through other art forms like film, um, you know, performative uh, art, art practices, theatre, um, visual arts, music, um, all of it. Uh, so, um, I mean, Benedict kind of hinted at this as well. In a way, we sometimes try to get people to read more by giving them as little to read as possible. Right. Thank you, Simon. You, you mentioned visual arts, and obviously um, here at Docs, visual arts is our um, one of our domains. So um, I'm interested um, in how you collaborate or if you collaborate with visual artists and what is the link between visual arts and literature at Molly, Simon? Yeah, I mean, there's a really, there's a really long tradition um, uh, within this island of literature, I suppose, acting um, uh, as a source of inspiration for other art forms. Um, and we've always felt that Molly that it was uh, incumbent upon us to continue that uh, tradition and to encourage to con encourage the, con the continuation of it. Um, so far, that's happened for us particularly through film, actually. So we've had um, uh, we've had two, I mean, very significant film commissions within Mali. One, which was uh, uh, what seemed like an impossible brief, which was a, a fifteen-minute short film version of Finnegan's Wake, um, shot all across the city using um, professional actors, members of the public. Um, really, a really successful uh, piece of work for children, actually, which was which was interesting. 
Um, we had a very significant film com uh, commission with the filmmaker Alan Gilsinham, which was a, a, quite a substantial 75-minute um, filmic response to Ulysses as well, which was running here for, for the first six months of opening. Um, and we continue actually to, to be really interested in exploring um, the presentation of literature through film within the museum. But um, I mean, we're also, we have, a, we have a, an online exhibition at the moment um, in development uh, that's looking at the Friel archives in the National Library of Ireland, um, but principally using dance actually as a medium, um, so filmed dance. Um, and we've quite a number of theatre collaborations in development as well that will, um, I think, take the subject beyond the walls of the museum and out into the city. Wow. Well, you have partly um, answered my next question, which, which was going to be um, about the other forms or formats and media that you uh, use at Molly, because when we speak about curating literature, it's not necessarily just the format of an exhibition. So, um, I, and Benedict, you mentioned uh, digital exhibitions and Simon now mentioned other formats. Um, could you say a little bit more about those? Because um, I know that there are many. Yeah, I think when we were, you know, from the very early days of Mali, uh, we, uh, the, the digital component was a really, really important part and really kind of developed uh, in tandem with, with the physical museum. Um, we really see the digital uh, function of the museum as, as a kind of museum within the museum as well. And it has a kind of a, a life of its own uh, within that and, and interacts with, with the physical exhibitions in, in very interesting ways sometimes as well. So this has kind of manifested itself in, in a number of different ways. Um, very early on in, in February uh, 2019, actually before the museum opened, we launched our own digital radio station, Radio Molly. Uh, which has been broadcasting ever since. Um, and that's um, really a lovely way to both uh, work with a, with a lot of different writers and artists. It's a great way to collect a lot of the activity that's, that's happening in Ireland and around the world um, and to make it available to the public. And it's a great way to engage people outside the island as, uh, outside the island as, as well as uh, within it um, uh, with, with the art form. Um, we have other, other, other manifestations as well, for example, a number of digital um, film commissions, uh, so working especially with the, in, in collaboration with the Department of Foreign Affairs, we've produced a number of short films specifically for online, um, and then online exhibitions as well. We, we, we have one uh, about uh, Frederick Douglass at the moment and, and a number of others in development, uh, as Simon has, has mentioned just then. So uh, I think one of the things that really interests us about that kind of digital space as well is that it can be very exper experimental. Um, there's great potential for it. It, it, it really is quite infinite. Um, so we don't necessarily have to put limitations on it from the beginning in the way that uh, a physical space, uh, while, while it has all, all of these incredible um, 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 uh, attributes, uh, values to it, um, in the digital space, we can really kind of head off in a direction uh, and see where it leads. Um, and and that's, that's very exciting for us in the museum because it, it gives us a possibility of exploring kind of curatorial avenues that, that are more difficult to explore in the physical space. And it must be exciting for the visitors, for your, for your audience too, I, I, I guess. Um, now time for hearing the next snippet um, uh, from a reading by Mike McCormack. And it must have been the same sort of unspooling, coupled with the same aptness for fantasy, that consumed my father and unravelled his mind in the last year of his life, especially during those last years when he lost his grip on the world completely and he withdrew to the old house, where there was only himself and the dog to keep each other company in those days after Ronnie's death. The long winter nights and the full weight of her absence must have come upon him with so much fear and loneliness that his grief was eclipsed completely in disbelief at the fact that his wife of over 40 years could ever leave him for any reason whatsoever. Death enclosed it. So here we are back again. Um, now, my next question, and you've mentioned this among all the different formats of your programming, is um, learning. Um, learning is at the core of Molly's vision, and it is described at your website really in a beautiful way as the desire to bring visitors on an inspiring journey through Irish writing and to encourage them to explore their own creative potential. 
Um, now, Simon, can you explain in what ways can visitors explore their creative potential at Mali? Yeah, this is. Um, yeah, I'm glad you picked up. You picked up on that. It's. Uh, it is. It is really actually at the core of a huge amount of the work here, um, and particularly actually on the on the learning side. I mean, the most obvious way for a lot of museums um, is through learning programs. So we have um, kind of a huge amount of work that we do, and um, particularly focused on much younger children um, in the first couple of years of, of the institution's life, and um, through on-site learning before COVID. Uh, and then actually the pandemic um, really dramatically expanded that for us into, into online uh, classroom programs. And actually we've just launched uh, on Monday this week, um, a really significant program that's going out to schools nationally all over the country. So, um, so that's really, really exciting. Uh, in tandem with that, we run a, a teen writers bursary, um, which is a really impressive program. Um, that uh, it's a it's a one week immersive program for teenage writers, um, where they get uh, they get exposed to um, major writers from all over Ireland and people from within the publishing industry. Um, really to kind of kickstart them uh, on their journey as an, uh, to becoming an adult writer. Um, and then within the exhibitions themselves, we, uh, we have a lot of moments where visitors are encouraged to, um, uh, I suppose, to explore their own creative potential, to listen to other writers um, talking about how they write and to kind of demystify the process a little bit. Um, uh, and to say, you know, this is really about sitting down and doing the work, you know, and, uh, and, and, and we've, in, in one particular room, we've magnetized a wall um, where people can, they can listen to other writers and then they can start something and they can put it up on the wall for other people to, other visitors to read. So it's actually really popular. So, um, yeah, we have, we, have, we have all of that going on alongside um, online programming for adults uh, as well um, and uh, right the way up to we've, we've run academic symposia and um, while we were open and we'll hopefully be kickstarting that again uh, now that we're back open um, and then I think a, a, a big kind of uh, threshold for us will be um, the museum moving some of our learning work into adult literacy and um, because we feel that a museum of literature really it shouldn't only be a place to um, discover uh, writers uh, and writing um, or a place to read. It should also be a place where people can come to learn to read as well. Wonderful. So there might be some uh, potential, some future stars of uh, Irish literature among your audience. Um, and now we'll so. hear, <laughs> let's hope so. We will um, hear another uh, snippet, uh, another short extract from a reading by one of the big names of contemporary Irish literature and that's Sarah Baum. We are driving, 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 over hill slopes and humpback bridges, through loose chippings and potholes wide as children's paddling pools and deep as old people's graves, past lavender hedges, betting shops, sports grounds, past countless closed doors behind which are countless uncaring strangers, their lives going on and on and on relentlessly. We are heading inland, keeping to the back roads as much as possible. You are looking out the rear window where the view is best, or perching on the passenger seat with your maggot nose pressed to the air vents. What do you smell? Fox spray and honeysuckle, pine martens and stinkhorns, seven different kinds of sap. Riding in the car is like watching a never ending reel at a wraparound cinema, complete with the surround sound of engine putter, the piped scent of petrol fumes and passing countryside. So all these extracts um, that we've heard so far, and we're going to hear one more, um, all these writers are part or in their books are included in this new uh, recently launched source of learning, another source of learning that Molly um, launched um, uh, not long ago. It is an online platform featuring uh, 100 Irish books published in the last decade. And here I'd like to give over to Margaret to present this platform. Thank you, Nicola. It's a pleasure to join with Mali colleagues this evening in our international uh, collaboration and conversation. As you said, this is a new digital resource launched just last month, and it's a chance for us to bring the richness of Irish writing 
uh, to audiences around the world because it's a free public access website called contemporaryirishwriting.ie. And I'm very pleased that my colleague, Dr. Jennifer Preston, who has played a key role in this project, is going to give us a short demo now, uh, a run through the project uh, and the riches to be discovered there. Thanks, Margaret. I'm delighted to participate in this event. The first entry I'm going to look at is the novel Milkman by Anna Burns. Milkman was published by Faber and Faber in 2018, and a Czech translation of the text was published last year. The entry opens with a quote from the author. Below this, you'll see a link which will direct you to the source from which the quote was taken. A short description of the text follows this, usually drawn from the publisher's website. The entry is then broken down into a number of categories. An excerpt of this text was available online, so we've included this in an excerpt section. We then have a section for interviews. Here you'll see the source of each interview and its title, as in this example in the Irish Times. Clicking on this link will bring you directly to this interview. Following this, we have a section for prizes and awards with the name of each award and the year. Again, clicking on the links here will bring you to a website or an article with more information. We then have a section for reviews taken from online newspapers, magazines and blogs, an audio section featuring podcasts, radio interviews and excerpts from the text, and a video section with links to resources such as award ceremonies, author readings and interviews. The next text that I'm going to look at is Tust August Allegar, an Irish language poetry collection by Alvin Igarovig. Published by Cush came in 2016, Czech translations of a selection of poems from this collection are forthcoming. Again, the entry opens with a quote from the author. In this instance, the quote is in the Irish language, so we've provided an English language translation below this. This is followed by a description of the text, also provided in Irish, with an English language translation. We then have our interview section and a section for prizes and awards, a review section from Irish language newspapers, magazines and blogs, and a section for audio resources and video resources, some of which are in English and some of which are in Irish. At the end of each entry, we've included a resources for readers section, where we've added any additional resources that we feel may be of use to readers, such as author profiles or biographies and related articles. At the top of the page, you'll see a number of tags. Clicking on these tags will show you a selection of texts from within the same genre, and you can also use the tags to filter your searches on the website. The final entry that I'm going to look at is Solar Bones by Mike McCormack, whose work features this evening. Solar Bones was published by Tramp Press in 2016. Again, the entry opens with a quote from the author himself and is followed by a description of the text. A preview of this text was available on Google Books, so we've included that in the excerpt section. We then have our interview section with resources such as this interview with the stinging fly, our prizes and awards section showcasing the many honours associated with this text, such as the International Dublin Literary Award, and our review section and our audio section. This entry has a wide range of material in its video section, ranging from author readings, such as this one in Kenny's Bookshop in Galway, to a lecture given by the author in Villanova University in the United States. And this demonstrates the variety of resources, even within the entries themselves. That's just a brief overview of some of the resources on contemporaryirishwriting.ie. Now I'll hand back over to Margaret. Thank you so much, Jennifer. This was a really wonderful demonstration of the kinds of things that you can find on this online platform. Uh, and I'll turn to Margaret now um, to ask uh, a little bit about the background of the project. How, how did it come about? Thanks, Andre. I have to say you and I have sailed together in a number of ships in Irish literature before, but this has to be the most impressive. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to, to speak with you in this event. Yet the project had two generations uh, behind its formation 
In 2016, uh, with colleagues from the School of English Drama and Film at UCD, we chose 50 books that we felt represented an important area of Irish writing. But this new resource took that project and added two crucial dimensions. We became a list of, of 100 writers, but also through the work of the colleagues you've met this evening and Molly, through in particular Benedict and the digital curation team, we were able to launch a much more ambitious vision for the project, uh, which is now delivered in this website. So that has enabled us to choose 100 texts by 98 different writers. We, we made an important decision uh, that each author would be featured by just one text, with two important exceptions, Dirini Griefa and Eilish Nigwivna, whom, as their names suggest, write in both languages. Uh, and we felt that that allowed them the opportunity to be doubly represented. Thank you. Um, I think that creating such a platform is a bit like editing an anthology and anyone who's ever done that uh, will know about the perils of this involved in excluding people etc so can you talk a little bit about uh, what the criteria were for inclusion because no anthology can be all all comprehensive that's that's naturally clear that's so true uh, and for us this is a snapshot of the diversity and vitality of contemporary Irish writing, which is itself a, a sort of kaleidoscope, uh, and uh, that seems like the correct metaphor for our light-filled rooms uh, this evening. So as you say, the, the task of selection is a difficult one, and therefore it's important for us that the resource is also a way to in, encounter not just these 100 texts, but the many others through the various links that Jennifer has just explained. Uh, by beginning with one text and, and moving to the videos or to the reviews. I think one is brought in turn on, on a much longer journey and on that journey one will discover other writers. But to come back to your criteria of, of inclusion, two key words for us were diversity and range and therefore over the 100 texts we're seeking to include a range of genres, uh, a range of generations of writers, and also indeed a range of languages. We're very proud of the Irish language representation uh, on the website. Uh, and also for us, the, you may have noticed that our subtitle, so to speak, is Books That Changed a Nation. Uh, and all of the 100 books have done that in different ways. Sometimes that's through their, their content, sometimes it's through their form. Mike McCormick's gloriously unfinished sentence, for example, or, or Jeremy Griefa's really genre-breaking uh, work throughout her writings. But also there may be sadder reasons why the book is an event. Uh, so, for example, we include uh, Human Chain, Seamus Heaney's last published collection of poetry, uh, and more recently, alas, the last published collection by Van Boland, The Historians, which was published posthumously. So those two books, Andre, you know, for very sad reasons, are themselves key events and milestones in Irish publishing history. Uh, perhaps less sadly, we also have book as an event because we have the first book uh, published by a number of writers, for example, Michelle Gallen, a very vibrant, exciting young Northern Irish writer, is featured in her first novel. Thank you very much. And now, particularly through the work on this compendium, the, this, this kaleidoscope of, of contemporary writing, could you tell us a little bit about what you think are the, the you know, the most um, striking changes or features of the contemporary literary scene in Ireland? That's, that's a, a great question and it's interesting to note that for the selections that we featured for the last two years, we invited the members of Mali to participate uh, by making uh, nominations to us to, to guide us uh, in, in our selection. And from their nominations in particular, I think we could see one key trend, which is the growing importance in contemporary Irish writing of memoir and of other forms of nonfiction. 
there's a way in which through the hundreds of years of writing, which Benedict mentioned earlier that are featured in Mali, there's a way in which Irish writing has always been distinguished by that sense of experiment, experimentation, by breaking genres, by creating new genres. And it's been great to see that happen in new ways in, in recent years through memoir and biography and autobiographical writing. So I'm thinking, of course, of the wonderful work of Emily Pine, my colleague at UCD, uh, but also more recent work by Patrick Frayne, by Owen de Vradoon, a young traveller, male writer, um, whose writings are really hard to classify by genre. They're stories, they're folk tales, uh, they're heritage stories, uh, and they're all the more compelling because of that difficulty of, of pinning them down. But could I, could, could I, Anwe, in a way, turn that question back to you as a, as a teacher yourself of, of Irish literature and what have you noticed in, in recent years? Well, first of all, I have to say that, that there's a sheer amount of it. And, uh, and OK, Ireland has always had an extraordinary number of successful writers per capita, but, uh, but now it it's just seems like, like a complete explosion. And it's even for a specialist, it's, it's really, really hard to keep up with the, the, new, the new developments. Uh, it's particularly fascinating to watch, uh, I suppose for anyone, not just for specialists, to watch the developments in, in Irish writing over the last, say, 20, 30 years, because uh, they have a lot of changes to reflect in terms of Irish society and Irish culture. Uh, you can start with the rapid and unexpected boom of the Irish economy and then its sudden demise. Uh, think about the rapid, uh, rapid globalization uh, of Ireland, ethnic diversification of a society which, which a bit like the Czech society used to be pretty much all white. The dismantling of the dominant political and social influence of the Catholic Church uh, and also of the monolithic, uh, monolithic discourse of Irish identity and nationalism. Uh, and I think that, that this is reflected in the writing. It's, it's, uh, it's very hard to generalize, and, and you know that I hate to do that, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll just venture one, perhaps just one generalization, and that is that I think there has been generally a move away from the national narrative in, in Irish writing and the image of Ireland as a post-colonial country towards a focus on marginalized groups and individuals, women, the LGBTQ community, the elderly, the non-white people living in Ireland, uh, and generally on the experience of those people who have been oppressed you know, in, in any kind of way or cast out by society. It's fascinating also to watch the new ways of developing uh, the rich tradition of Irish medieval writing and of, of the oral tradition uh, and, uh, and how that helps perhaps paradoxically to continue and develop the, the great legacy of Irish modernism represented by Joyce and Flann O'Brien and Samuel Beckett. It's also wonderful to see a, the richness of Irish language writing and also the increased communication between Irish language writers and English language writers in Ireland and also scholars, very important. And, uh, and I think, uh, yes, indeed, our next writer um, in our next video is a bilingual one. So that can be a demonstration. So uh, here's a snippet from a reading by Derenie Griffith. When we first met, I was a child and she had been dead for centuries. Look, I am 11, a girl who is terrible at sums and at sports, a girl given to staring out windows, a girl whose only real gift lies in daydreaming. The teacher snaps my name, startling me back to the flimsy prefab. Her voice makes it a fine day in 1773 and sets English soldiers crouching in ambush. I add ditch water to drench their knees. Their muskets point towards a young man who is tumbling from his saddle now in slow, slow motion. A woman rides in to kneel over him, her voice rising in an antique formula of breath and syllable the teacher calls a queena, a keen to lament the dead. 
that's a truly wonderful book, I have to say, and, and I'm so glad that it is currently, as, as we speak, being translated into, into the Czech language. Um, I have another question for you, Margaret, and, and that is how the users of contemporary Irish writing Dohai can keep informed about the new writers emerging in Ireland. That's a key issue for us, and it relates very well, Andre, to what you've just commented upon yourself in relation to, you know, some of the key forces in contemporary Irish writing. It's a particular pleasure to see new voices emerging exactly from the communities you mentioned, you know, that have been included. So one writer who comes very strongly to mind, for example, is Malate Uche Kore, who writes about the contemporary scandal that is direct provision in contemporary Irish society. But it's also important that we keep abreast of writers that in a way we haven't heard of already. So one of the ways we've done that, actually even in the week since the launch of the programme, is we've added a feature to the platform already whereby users can receive information as to the various literary journals that are uh, operating in the Irish scene uh, and working with colleagues and Molly here to put that list together. I think we were all delighted, even startled, to see how long a list it is. Uh, and again, it's clear that those writers have played a key part in shaping uh, reputations. I'm thinking in particular of The Stinging Fly, which has played a key part in fostering the early career of Daniel McLaughlin, Mike McCormack, Kevin Barry, just to name a few. I'm thinking also of the importance of the Dublin Review and its role in fostering non-fiction writers. Also the role of new arrivals like Uncoupled Durica that are playing a really important role. So they, I think, Andre, will be the bridges for us all in the future, bridges that will enable writers to be published for the first time. Uh, and then, I suppose, move through the stages of publication uh, that will bring them into the world of our syllabi as university teachers, but crucially into the life of readers. I mean, this evening, I suppose, above all, we're celebrating international readership. Uh, and one of our great hopes for this site is that the Czech audience here I will discover new delights in Irish writing. You know, you've heard four wonderful voices already, uh, and our platform is providing dozens of others. It's, uh, I was so grateful to see that, that you've actually uh, added the journals to the resource recently, because, uh, I mean, the contrast couldn't be greater, you know, if you, if you think about the time when in Ireland, the bell was pretty much the only platform available to young and upcoming writers, the, the contrast just couldn't be greater. And it, it, it is fabulous, particularly at a time when, when, when we all know how difficult it is to actually sustain and run a journal um, in, in, in any sort of feasible way. So we're, we're extremely grateful. And of course, for an international audience, it is just absolutely impossible to follow the new developments, what the journals are and, 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 and what is happening in those. Um, my last question to you, Margaret, is what do you hope uh, will be the lasting significance of the digital platform? I, I think in a way this evening's event are, already answers that, Andre, that our hope always with this website was to bring Irish writing to new audiences. It, it's been a pleasure already in the last few weeks to see the amount of engagement with the site, and that includes, for example, members of book clubs, uh, as well as individual readers and many university students. But I think tonight and, and the sport indeed of the Department of Foreign Affairs probably reminds me of maybe one of the most fundamental objectives of the website is to allow Irish literature to travel. Um, so that we in Mali and also in UCD can be ambassadors for that. Uh, and to really bring, be mediators and, and brokers in the best sense of the word in, in introducing readers and audiences to these just wonderful, very brave and very resilient artists. Thank you very much. I have to say that we are, we are I suppose I'm speaking on behalf of the entire international community of readers uh, mm -hmm. to express our gratitude to your work and to the work of Molly in promoting Irish literature. Um, our time is nearly up, so I would uh, like to first of all thank 
uh, to all participants in this program, and in particular to Simon O'Connor and Benedict Schlepper uh, Connolly from Mali, and to uh, Margaret Kelleher from, from UCD, uh, also to our four featured authors and uh, the translators. And I'd like to reminder, uh, remind our, our spectators that uh, now they can watch the complete videos of the readings with Czech translations if they're interested, and that these are going to be posted together with the recording of the stream on the, the Docs uh, YouTube channel and also on the website of the Center for Irish Studies. And last, but certainly not very, not least, I'd like to thank Docs and Michaela Shilpochova for hosting us with this event. Thank you, Andre. Um, just one last sentence. I would like to wish Molly all the best of luck and many visitors and many new talents and, um, and so good luck with your wonderful work you're doing. Um, thank you, Andre, uh, for um, co-hosting this event. And uh, I would also like to thank everybody who was watching us tonight. And hopefully we will all meet soon here um, on board the Gulliver airship in Prague. So thank you everyone and have a good evening.